this, this session's on, on the great Murray Rothbard, who's the reason why most of us are here. Uh, what we'll do is we're, go, we're, gonna, we're gonna have four people talk that were, had significant interaction and were friends of, of Murray Rothbard. Uh, we'll begin with Roger Garrison, uh, then David Gordon, Walter Block, and then myself. And we'll, we'll each speak for eight minutes or so, uh, and we'll just reminisce and, and talk about Murray's qualities and what he meant to us and, and, and his influence on our research. So we'll begin with Roger Garrison. Oh. Uh, in 1972, there was a book that appeared called, it usually begins with Ayn Rand, uh, by Jerome Tuchilli. It's gone through several editions since then. You can still buy it on Amazon.com. Now, in 70, by 72, I had long since started reading Ayn Rand. Uh, and I read it while I was doing four years service as commissioned officer in the US Air Force. I had graduated with a BS in electrical engineering from Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. And you might, that title tells you it was an awfully hardcore engineering school. No social sciences, <laughs> okay? So I was sort of an unlikely person to be attracted by uh, D Jerome Tuchilli or by Murray Rothbard, but that's exactly what uh, happened. Uh, Milton Friedman, as I mentioned the other day, does that work? Yeah, uh, Get Had uh, ended, had been very instrumental in ending the military draft. And my complaint about him is that he didn't do it quite soon enough to keep me out of the military, <laughs> but so, such as it was. So uh, I had one of the, the uh, first edition copies of Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. That was uh, 1967. I was in upstate New York, Rome, New York, and I had to either go uh, west to Syracuse or east to Albany to find a decent bookstore where I could get these uh, Rand uh, books. Uh, and in that capitalism, the unknown ideal, uh, there were about 26 chapters, including the uh, appendix, uh, 20 of them from Rand, three from Alan Greenspan, one from Na Nathaniel Brandon, and one from Robert Hessen. I suppose the most economics-oriented one was Alan Greenspan. I, I hate to say that's, that's what got me started in economics by reading <laughs> Alan uh, Greenspan in, in the late 1960s. Uh, but that book also had a list of references, which included Mises, about eight references, Bon Beverk, one, Benjamin Anderson, Henry Hazlitt, Lawrence Fertig, but nothing, no references to F.A. Hayek or to Murray Rothbard. But it turns out if you start following the literature, you find both of those pretty quickly. And I found Rothbard, Man, Economy, and State, uh, and read that with a lot of excitement. Uh, eventually, I got out of the Air Force, and I, I went to University of Missouri, Kansas City, and got a master's degree uh, in economics. And while I was there, I wrote the Austrian, Austrian macroeconomics, this is the original edition that the Institute now has reprints for. And I wrote it as a term paper in a master's level macro course. The uh, instructor, Bob Brazelton, uh, appreciated the, the effort and asked me to, pre to, to present it at a conference in Chicago. I think it was a Midwest Economic Conference. I'm not even sure of that because I was kind of in a daze at that point uh, anyhow. Um, but uh, it struck fear in me. I didn't think I was prepared to lecture on Austrian economics or Austrian macro, especially at a national convention like that. And I needed more feedback. Was this, was this paper really any good? So I sent it to Murray Rothbard. And just in a few days, I got a call. Actually, the call came from Joey. And I uh, talked to her for a minute. She said, well, Murray wants to talk to you. 
And it struck fear in me again, you <laughs> know, Murray. <laughs> and of course, Murray is Murray. I mean, he, he came on the phone cackling and carrying on and cracking jokes. <laughs> and I was wondering, is this the right Murray Rothbard? You know, I don't, I can't really tell. Uh, but anyhow, he, he, liked the, he liked the thing, which sort of surprised me because he's not really into graphics. But he saw it as beating the Keynesians at their own game, and that's what he was chuckling about. He was, that, was, that was good, and it was, it was funny. So he asked me, he said, well, you're going to be uh, in New York anytime soon. Well, I had no plans whatsoever to go to New York. So I said, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> And was soon on my way to New York. He had invited me over for dinner, and I went to dinner. And then we had uh, it was just it was just the three of us, Joey and Murray and myself, for dinner. But then guests arrived, including none other than Walter Block, and also Walter Grinder and Bill Stewart. I think we'd figure it out with one of, was actually a student of Grinder's. And uh, we went through that article page by page, and it was, it was quite a long article, mostly graphs, but quite a long article. And it got to be three o'clock or four o'clock in the morning. And I didn't realize that uh, Rothbard uh, <laughs> stayed up late, to say the least, okay? And several times I started edging towards the front door thinking I've overstayed my... And, and they seem to be insulted by this. You know, where are you going? You know, we're not through with this paper. So, <laughs> so anyhow, I left somewhere between 3.30 and 4, as I, as I remember, I was kind of bleary-eyed, so I couldn't, not sure I could read my watch at that point. But it was a wonderful evening, unforgettable, actually. Uh, and he had invited me uh, the next day uh, to, to come and sit in, in on his class at Brock, Brooklyn Polytechnic. Institute, I did that, and uh, that w that was fun. Uh, and then it turns out uh, he was signing books for a new liberty at Laissez Faire Books, and I went with him uh, with that. And first time I'd been in Laissez Faire Bookstore, obviously hadn't been in New York for a long time even. And so it was just a, it was just a wonderful trip and and something I'd never forget. And uh, I considered him a friend uh, from that uh, from that day on. Um, now, when I finally got out of the Air Force uh, and, got the, and, and got the degree at UMKC, I took a wrong turn, and it, don't tell anyone this, but ended up uh, working for the Kansas City Federal Reserve Bank for about two and a half. <laughs> but then went to Virginia, University of Virginia, and got my doctorate degree. But in the meantime, uh, Murray uh, <clears throat> was doing going to be doing a conference at Cornell on economic history. He, he and uh, Forrest McDonald, uh, and they invited me to that, which and so I went. And then the very next year, '74, that was a big South Royalton blowout, and uh, I came to that. And then there were two more conferences uh, year by year after that. One at uh, Hartford, University of Hartford. Uh, and Hayek was at that one, I remember. And then uh, the, the next year at uh, Windsor Castle in uh, England, and Hayek was at that. So I was, I was sort of on a roll at that point. <laughs> uh, after which uh, I took a job, I left the Fed, and, uh, and, and went to the University of Virginia, uh, where I got my uh, doctorate degree in economics, uh, and then soon after that came to Auburn, about five years ahead of the Institute, and was certainly happy to see the Institute come too, okay? Well, that's my story. Thank you. Well, I think uh, when you met Murray Rothbard, the first thing would uh, impress people was that he knew everything. He really did. Uh, I often used to go, and the way he 
was able to know everything was he had an amazing ability to read uh, very fast and absorb all the material. In that way, he was like his teacher, Joseph Dorfman, the one he'd gotten his PhD with at Columbia. I often used to go to bookstores with him. For example, one we liked were in uh, Manhattan, where the Strand Bookstore was his favorite, and there were ones in uh, the Bay Area that he liked to go to. And he would go into the bookstore, and he he could go down the shelves, and he would read every book, and he would be able to say, oh, what was in this one, what was in that one. He, he would do, no matter, no matter what the subject, he had an amazing range of reference. He would just know everything. I'll give you a few illustrations. Uh, some of you may know that uh, there was a libertarian philosopher, very famous one, Robert Nozick, that he didn't get along with all that well, but the reason, the reason they initially didn't get along very well was that they had, when Nozick met Rothbard, they had a big argument about whether you could measure utility. And Nozick took the point of view that you couldn't, Rothbard didn't. And if you look, uh, Rothbard knew all the philosophical literature on this topic, not just the economics. For example, if you look in his uh, toward reconstruction of utility and welfare economics. He not only knew Carl Hempel's work, but there was an unpublished part of the Hempel's book that he was able to refer to. So this uh, gave him, it was very hard to ask him something that he didn't know. Uh, I remember once I like uh, history trivia questions, and I was telling Murray that I would had a conversation with Mel Bradford, who was an outstanding scholar that we both knew. And I was able to, uh, he, uh, Bradford really knew American history extremely well, but I was able to give Bradford a question he didn't know, which was, what was Rutherford Hayes's middle name? So I was telling uh, Murray about that, and he said, ah, it was Burchard, of course. <laughs> uh, he he uh, he didn't know just economics and philosophy and political theory, but he was very interested in, uh, in art history. His specialty was German Baroque churches, and it turned out he'd been friends. He'd known in the 1940s uh, Leo Steinberg, who became one of the great uh, art historians, a specialist in the Re Renaissance. He was very very much interested in Leo Steinberg's work on art history. So many things that uh, Murray didn't, uh, didn't uh, publish about, he knew a lot about. If you just read his published works, you just get a, a small idea of the range of his knowledge. Uh, another example comes to mind in 1980, there was a conference at uh, Albany held in honor of Thomas Saas. So Murray gave a paper on psychohistory, which was the, the use of psychoanalysis in uh, trying to understand history. Murray was very critical of it. And he was able to absorb all the literature on psychoanalysis. He, was, he knew all the books critical of Freud. He had a complete bibliography of that. So, Again, any topic you were to ask him, he would, he would know an enormous about. Now, in addition to his wide range of knowledge, he had a tremendous analytical mind. If you gave him an argument, he would see instantly what was wrong with it, what were the uh, flaws in it. He would know all sorts of references that could be cited about it. Uh, I can't really think of anyone that I've met who could really match him in the quickness and sharpness of his intellect. And he certainly, of the people I've met, he's the one who influenced me the most. He and his wonderful wife, Joey, were very kind to me, and he, uh, I'll never forget what they did for me. I should tell you also that uh, Murray was 
interested not only in uh, in information scholarship, but he had a very keen interest in people. For example, at the Mises University programs that we had when he was uh, he was here and he was teaching them, he would be very interested in what all the students were doing. Uh, I remember on one occasion I was sitting with him at that time when we had them at Stanford, everyone would go to all the lectures and I was sitting with him and we were making notes and uh, a, a woman came up who was in the class and said, uh, you seem to be having a good time during the lecture. And what we didn't tell her was we were making lists of which students should be kicked out of the <laughs> program. <laughs> I want, uh, another time, uh, uh, Murray was, I was telling Murray about some item about, he was very interested in about concerned uh, some item, something had been going on. He really, he really wanted to know. He, he, uh, he, I was talking to him about this. It was sort of a very confidential item. It was, as they say, hot gossip item. So a student came up and was sort of standing there while we were talking, Murray looked around and said, can't you see we're busy? <laughs> and he, he wanted to know what everybody was doing about everything. And he, he really was a wonderful person. I don't think uh, I'd ever meet anyone as uh, great as he was, and I'm very fortunate to have known him. Thank you. The big problem I had with Murray Rothbard was stomach cramps. <laughs> he was so funny. He just had me in stitches for hours. I almost died of stomach something or other. I mean, he was just hilarious, making fun of everybody and Bill Buckley. And you know, it, he was just, he was horrible. <laughs> just, <yeah. laughs> uh, he was the sort of person that my parents warned me against. Uh, he would drink alcohol. And uh, he would uh, maybe smoke, and he would stay up late. He'd stay up till five in the morning, and you know all these bad things. It was just uh, very bad. Murray would just cackle like a banshee about playing Risk, and he would say, you know, we anarchists are the only ones who can play Risk, which is the idea you take over the world, uh, uh, where nobody, else, everyone else wanted to take over the world, we didn't, so we could sort of play it honestly. <laughs> Uh, one of the most admirable things about Murray is the way he treated Hans Hoppe. Murray grounded um, uh, libertarianism in natural law, natural rights, and along comes this punk kid, Hans. And I, I, uh, Murray is 15 years older than me, and Hans is maybe 10 years younger, so Murray's like 25 years older than Hans, and maybe Murray was 50 and Hans was 25. I forget the exact uh, years. And Hans came along with this much better grounding of libertarianism in Murray's view, uh, the argument from argument. And usually what happens is when you're the leader of, of a group, like Murray was, and some kid comes along and, and does you better, what you do is, you, like if, if somebody ever tried this on Ayn Rand, you'd kick him right out. Uh, and Murray embraced this. And, and to me, this was one of the, uh, sort of an indication of where he was at, where he was coming from. He was after the truth, and if Hans did something better than him, uh, he acknowledged that and thanked Hans and uh, uh, supported Hans. Uh, when I first started writing my writing career, I would keep track of how many uh, words per day I could do. And I would keep uh, track in terms of number of pages, and each page had around 300 words. So if I did five pages a day, that was pretty good, 1,500 words. And every once in, most days I wouldn't do uh, five pages, but every once in a while I'd do, most, uh, sometimes I would do five, and sometimes 10, sometimes 15. One day, I got up really early at eight in the morning, and I worked until two the next morning, and I did uh, 23 pages. Uh, which was way more than anything I had ever done. So I'm, you know, feeling macho, and I'm going to compare myself with a man. I would never compare myself about quality. I mean, that's sort of like my chess against Bobby Fish's chess. I'm just talking about quantity. So I call Murray, and I said, well, how many uh, pages can you do in a day? And he goes, meh, meh, who keeps track of that? <laughs> and, but I pressed. I was uh, sort of pushy, and though, well, I still am now. <laughs> so, shut up. <laughs> It's true, but, um, you know. <laughs> so uh, finally, Murray says, eight pages an hour. <laughs> eight 
pages an hour? I mean, so my whole day of 23 pages was roughly three of his hours. And, you know, a good typist who does 100 words a minute could beat Murray uh, in terms of typing, eight pages an hour. But, I mean, Murray is typing on a, on a typewriter, none of these computer things. And, uh, you know, and it, it's just original work. I remember one time Murray was, uh, we were sitting around in the living room and uh, Murray was saying, well, he has to prepare this paper for, you know, two weeks from now. And Joey says, what? Two weeks from now? You have to do it tomorrow. So Murray disappears into his office for uh, an hour or two and he comes out with 12 pages or something like that. It, it's really, he was just uh, phenomenal. Um, when I... Uh, I, I was born in Brooklyn. I was a, a track teammate in high school of Bernie Sanders. My views on uh, economics were roughly like his views then. I went through an Ayn Rand phase, and then I was a, a minarchist, like Ayn Rand. And then um, Larry Moss and Jerry Wallows, his roommate, tried to convince me to meet Murray Rothbard, and the attraction was that Murray was an anarchist, so I didn't want to meet him, because he, you know, an anarchist is crazy. You can't be an anarchist. You know, that, that's just chaos and, and, and weirdness. So I didn't want to meet Murray. And finally, the two of them ganged up on me and uh, prevailed upon me to meet with Murray, and he converted me into... Uh, anarchism in about five minutes. I mean, it was the, the fastest uh, conversion ever, I think. I'm, I'm not sure about that. But uh, he just sort of used my arguments that I got from Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson uh, about uh, uh, market failure and um, uh, if you do well, you prosper, and if you do badly, uh, you lose out. And he just applied it to the government, which I had never thought to do. The... Uh, he just really wanted to be my friend. And I could never understand that because I'd read Man, Economy, and State all during the day. And then at night, I'd go to his uh, dinner parties. And what would a, a genius like that want to do with me? Uh, and the only way I could be worthy of him was be to argue with him. So I would just say, well, on page 202, this is a mistake. And he was just, I was a real pain in the neck. <laughs> And he was so nice. Uh, he had a picture of Mises on his wall. And I said, how could you have a picture of Mises on your wall? Mises wasn't an anarchist. And Murray just sort of smiled at me and said, well, you know, read Mises. You'll, you'll find it. He was so gentle and so kind to me. And I was such a pain in the neck. And I'm glad he was tolerant of me. And I try to be tolerant of my students to pass on the baton that uh, Murray passed on to me. I have one distinction that I think no one else on this planet has, and that I think I'm the only co-author with Murray on anything. Virtually everything that Murray wrote, he wrote as a single author, and one thing he and I are the co-author. This was when I was the associate editor of the Review of Austrian Economics, which was the predecessor to the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, of which Joe Salerno is now editor. I wanted to mention something about Joe. There was this uh, debate. Uh, when did the modern Austrian revival start? Was it in 1973 with the South Royalton thing? Uh, and then Hayek's Nobel Prize around that time. And uh, the South Royalton thing, you had three speakers. You had Murray, Izzy Kersner, and um, Ludwig Lachmann. And there must have been, oh, 40 or so of, of us, uh, 30, uh, 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 Roger was there, I think Joe was there, and, and 30 other people in their 30s uh, like me. And Joe made the point, well, if the revival of modern Austrian economics started in 1973, how did you get 30 young people uh, to attend this thing? And uh, Joe quite clearly says, and I think very accurately, that it wasn't in 1973 started, it was in 1962, which was the publication of Man, Economy, and State. So I, I think that um, Murray's, that book uh, w was really uh, the key element of the, uh, of the start. Um, I remember one time, uh, I have a friend, Michael Edelstein, and he is a mentor, uh, uh, Albert Ellis, the therapist, is a mentor of my friend, Michael Edelstein, and me and Michael and Murray went over to Albert Ellis's house and we sung rational songs. It was sort of one of the highlights in, in my, uh, my career. Um, I, I have uh, so many, many other stories to tell about Murray. Uh, I... I regard him as a friend. He regarded me as a friend. I, I'm honored in that. I, I think he is the, um, 
the, the second best economist in the history of the universe, second to Mises, uh, and he is certainly the, the first best libertarian and theor historian and uh, uh, he uh, philosopher, I mean, he, uh, sociologist, he uh, was a real renaissance person. I'm honored to have known Murray, uh, my dear friend. Thank you, Walter. I like Robert Higgs uh, still more and Murray to this day. Uh, I I came across his name uh, for uh, in, 19, in uh, my junior year in in um, college. I read a, an article in the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine in which uh, it mentioned happened to mention that Murray Rothbard was the leader of the libertarian movement in the U.S. and also was an Austrian economist. And I had heard the term Austrian economist in my history of economic thought class. So I, was, and I thought it was simply a closed chapter of economic thought. Uh, well, I mentioned this to some of uh, the people I hung around with at the uh, Young Americans for Freedom. There was sort of a libertarian wing and, and then there were some conservatives. And one of the people handed me a little booklet. Uh, I was an economic major at the time uh, and it was uh, this booklet, Economic Depressions, Their Cause and Cure, but it was in the form of a, a, what was called a, a Bramble mini book. I think it was uh, published by the Constitutional Alliance in Michigan. But anyway, it was about a third of the size of this. It was literally a, a, a mini book. It was very small. So I read it right away, and um, it took about 45 minutes to read. And it completely changed my intellectual outlook. I, I learned more from that book uh, in, in those 45 minutes, and I had in two and a half years of sitting through, you know, dull, dreary, dismal courses on, on macroeconomics and the principles of macroeconomics and, and fiscal policy. Uh, so that, that was the point at which I, I, I first became familiar with Murray Rothbard. I then was, uh, when I went to graduate school, I was elected vice president of the... Um, New Jersey Libertarian Party. And so my, myself and the president heard that Murray Rothbard was speaking over in New York at a, at a, con at a Libertarian conference. So I went over to, we went to see him and I was very excited. And by, in, in the meantime, between reading the small mini book uh, and, and going to the conference, I had read most of his other things. So I had in my mind, of course, an image of him as a very scholarly and grave presence. Uh, and when we got there, and he, it was his turn to speak, this, this short, jolly, well, actually joyous guy just bounded up onto the stage and says, you know, I just came back from Europe and I'm glad I'm here. He says, I can say the word anarchist without being hooted down. Uh, and so uh, one thing that stood out in my memory was that the, the speaker before Murray Rothbard was Robert Lefebvre, who uh, was uh, a pacifist as well as a libertarian and didn't even believe in, in self-defense against violence. So at the end of Murray's talk, someone raised their hand and said, well, do you accept Lefebvre's, Lefebvre's position? And so Mar Murray, who always was great at, at um, giving you examples, instead of answering the question directly, he said, well if, well, if somebody was across the room with a mallet and was coming at me, I'd plug him. <laughs> so so I, this guy's great. I mean, you know, he, he's just a wonderful personality as well as a, um, a great, great scholar. Uh, so a, a few months later, uh, I decided as the vice president of the Libertarian Party in New Jersey to have him speak at our, our convention. And so he was, you know, and I, I called him up and I told him that we didn't really have much money and so on. And so I was going to try to bargain him down to $100 to come across the river to New Jersey. But he says, well, I'll do it for $75. And I said, fine, that's great. So he came and, and um, some, some people, I think, yeah, someone, he didn't drive. Um, or he only, he, as he said to me, he says, I formally drive, I have a license, but I really, I don't drive. So he came over and uh, so we were talking and I happened to mention that I was a graduate student in economics at Rutgers University and um, he immediately, we were talking about something else, he immediately stopped and he, 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 he was overjoyed. So he started looking around for a pen or pencil to write my name down. So I gave him a pen, he wrote my name down. He said, I'll have people get in touch with you on Monday. I don't know what that meant, but <laughs> I said, okay, yeah. 
But sure enough, on Monday, somebody called me up and said that uh, well, we heard from our Rothbard that you're a, a good Austrian and that, that uh, you know, we want you to join our reading group. And I did. I joined the reading group and we were, I, Walter was in it, actually, Richard Fink and, and a few others. And uh, so at, so I guess there were reports back to Murray by members of the group that I was good. So at some point, I was asked to come to Murray's apartment. And I, I you know, like Roger, I was very, very uh, afraid. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I knew he was jolly and pleasant and everything, but I didn't know how it would be one-on-one. -on -one. And, and basically, he was, he was vetting me to see, to see how hardcore I was. So I, Richard Fink drove me over there. I, I went to his uh, apartment, and we were in a living room, and it was you know, midnight, 1 o'clock. We were still discussing things. So he asked me about the looter question, so, you know, because uh, the riots had occurred in 67, 68. And his position was that, um, you, you, you know, if, if a looter's coming into your store, you can shoot them. Um, but if they, ha if they take your property and they're running down the street, then you have to resort to the police or, you know, you, you can't shoot them in the back. I said, why not? He goes, ah, he says, I never thought of that. So, so you know, he says, ah, you're someone I could have a conversation with. <laughs> So I think I think I passed the audition, you know, with, with that with that answer. Um, and so that was uh, right before South Royalton. Then I got an invitation to South Royalton, and uh, as uh, Walter sort of covered South Royalton. But at the time, I I, I saw you know Murray Rothbard and Israel Kurzer and, and, and Ludwig Lachmann. I had read their works by then, and I you know I was very you know in awe of all of them. But when I thought more about it, I think Lou Rockwell had asked me to give a talk about man, economy, and state sometime in the 1980s, and I thought about it, and, and, it, and it struck me that, as Walter pointed out, in 1974, when we, we had the, the uh, conference at South Royalton, which was the first North American Austrian conference, uh, that all these young people showed up, young PhDs, graduate students like myself, and so on. And, and I said, well, where do they all come from? I mean, what, they, you know, it wasn't like a field of dreams. If you hold it, they will come. I mean, it <laughs> didn't happen like that. It wasn't a big bang. It wasn't a big bang. But then, then I look back, and it wasn't only man, economy, and state, but, but Rothbard had written America's Great Depression, What Has Government Done to Our Money, uh, Power and Market, and For New Liberty, all within the, between 1962 and, and, and 1973. And... To a, to a man, or to a man and woman, because there was a, Karen Vaughan was there, a woman, uh, everyone, everyone there was really a Rothbardian at that point. He was the, the main reason uh, behind the, the revival of Austrian economics. Uh, I just want to say a few other things. Uh, one, one of the greatest memories I have of Murray was meeting him at his favorite delicatessen in... Um, in New York, a Wolf's Delicatessen on the corner of 46th Street and 5th Avenue, a Jewish deli that just has great food, uh, and uh, you know, he loved. And uh, but we, during the so we would meet there maybe a few times a year, three times a year, four times a year. Um, he was teaching at Brooklyn Poly. I was teaching at Pace University in New York City. Uh, but in the 1990s, he was teaching at uh, Las Vegas, but he'd come back. Uh, in the summers, and so we were meeting while he was writing his history of economic thought, and he we would talk and you know exchange pleasantries, and then he would tell me about the new things he was finding in in the history of economic thought, and how this guy was really a bad guy, and how this guy who he thought was a bad guy was actually a good guy, how this guy had deviations and so on and so forth, and it was great. And he would go on, and then he'd stop and he'd say, oh, "I'm so sorry," he says, "You know, I haven't let you talk. Do you want to talk?" And he was giving me a private seminar. I mean, it was the greatest thing that, you know, he would think that I wouldn't want to hear him more. I mean, he was, he was really a humble seeker of truth. And I, and I, re I really, really appreciated that. Uh, and I think that really, that, that really sums him up. Uh, there was one other point I wanted to make. Um, no, I'll, I'll stop there. And then we can, we have, we'll have some time for some questions. Thank you. I know the point I wanted to make. He used to love, love Matt Helm, uh, uh, Matt Helm novels. And Matt Helm was kind of a, a lower rent but American version of James Bond. And he told me the one thing he learned from Matt Helm novels, and, and, and so he, you know, he, he had to actually have some props and stuff. He said, he says, well, he says, the first thing you learn is that when you come into a room, you got to come in blasting. He says, you can't ask any questions. You come in blasting. He's, 
but so that, that, was, that was the other side of Murray. I mean, he was just a, a, a wonderful individual and, and a great man. Thank <laughs> you.